Colleen Smith puppeteered the lead character of Brendar the Barbarian on the Nickelodeon show The Barbarian and the Troll. She also performed the sarcastic AI Betty on the Disney Plus show Earth to Ned. Her other credits include Know You Shut Up, The Happy Time Murders, and hundreds of live stage shows with Brian Henson's puppet improv show, Puppet Up Uncensored. I talked to Colleen about her path to puppetry, her thoughts on puppet improv, and much more on this episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. Welcome to the show that is preserving puppetry through the personal stories of professional puppeteers. My name is Grant Pachoco, and this is Under the Puppet. Colleen Smith, welcome to Under the Puppet. Hello. I'm so excited. It's it's always fun to do these interviews, but it's also fun when it's a friend and someone who I've worked with a lot. Yeah. So I'm very excited to have you here. I'm going to start like I always do. Do you remember the first time you saw puppets? The first time um, as a child you saw puppets? Probably uh, The Great Muppet Caper. That, I believe, is my first puppet, Muppet, all of it experience. That's the tape we you know wore out watching right. over and over and over again. Um, maybe Sesame Street was before that, but probably Great Muppet Caper. I have two older siblings, so I'm one of those kids that saw too many things before you were ready to see it. <laughs> Actually, the first movie I remember, one of the first movies I remember seeing was Poltergeist, which is terrifying to be one of my first movies. But would that clown count as a puppet? <laughs> sure. Or the tree? Yeah, somebody had to manipulate that yeah. special effects yeah. so the clown or the the <laughs> evil tree might have been or the skeletons yeah those might have been my first <laughs> that's definitely different than a uh, great muppet caper and <laughs> <laughs> so one or the other right and i i knew you grew up in hawaii but mm-hmm. on imdb it says you were born in korea mm-hmm. is that yeah my parents were both in the army and i believe most of the reassignments that i experienced were my mom being moved um and yeah, we were, we lived in Korea for me from, they were there, I think, th- they were there three years. I was born a year into it or something like that. I le- we left and then we went to Maryland and then when I was five, we moved to Hawaii. So I don't have much, I have no memory of Korea, a tiny little blip of a memory of Maryland sitting in the family room watching <laughs> Poltergeist. And then, and then most of my memories are Hawaii. Hawaii, yeah. And were your parents, uh, you said they're both in the army, were they creative at all? Yes. Uh, my dad should have not been in the army. My dad should have been some sort of uh, Hemingway, you know, an alcoholic and <laughs> living in different countries. I mean, that part of the army helped, living in different countries. And he, But he, he worked in advertising after he retired from the army in a very failed company. It's very tragic. Uh, but he loved it, and he loved books, and he... I think he he really should have done that, but he was of that ilk of you. You join the army and you take care of the family and you fight the fight and all that kind of stuff. And then you know we went to Vietnam and it totally ruined him. Well, it didn't ruin him, but you know it did what Vietnam does to people. Yeah. And my mom always said when I was younger, and I said I wanted to be an actress. She's like, I wanted to be an actress, and now she makes jewelry and quilts. So I think both of them were creative. My mom's, I think she's still finding it. Mm-hmm. I really, I think she loved nursing, and now she's trying to write sort of a memoir, which I think would be great. They both they both love books, and yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> well, and you mentioned during that that you said you wanted to be an actress at a young age. Were your siblings, like, into performing and stuff, and, and then you caught into that, or is that just solely you? you just wanted to, me. Yeah. And I knew young. Yeah. I think I knew when I was about five. That I wanted to be an actress. I think I understood what was on TV and movies, and I knew that they what they were doing. I wanted to do. Um, I don't know why I understood that, or. But yeah, I knew. There's pictures of me, and you can tell I'm a little (laughs) performer. You know, not performing. I actually didn't perform anything until, I think I was in. Catholic school doing you know Christmas plays or something like that, but. You could just tell by my demeanor. Probably there's a middle child thing, too, of peacekeeping. Yeah. That you learn, oh, if I make everybody laugh, dad won't be as angry, mom won't cry, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. 
When you were going to school, you know, you mentioned the Christmas pageants, but you're going to school like elementary school and junior high and high school. Were you going in productions, like auditioning for the plays and things like no, that? No, I'm sure Hawaii has theater, and I'm sure they have way more now. But as a kid, I don't remember there being a ton of performance opportunities, which was one of the reasons I hated growing up there. And I think I associated it with Hawaii as opposed to any suburban place you live is not going to have some huge theater scene. And the theater scene would most likely be downtown, which, you know, Hawaii is actually a pretty big city. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't aware of it. And so, yes, on a very small scale, it was just school stuff. And then I did a couple summer programs at these improv sketchy type things, which I loved. And it was when I figured out what improv was and that I wanted to do it. And then I did speech in high school. That was my big... So kind of like performing. Kind of like... I mean, it was. It was performing. But I wasn't like kids who grew up in L.A. or New York. Right. Who were like, I was, you know, auditioning for Broadway. I was at the (laughs) something. And I didn't go to some... I I find it interesting. I remember applying for colleges or looking at applications for colleges, and they'd ask you what your major was. And I thought, high schools have majors? I didn't understand that. And now everybody I know who has a teenager in L.A., talks about how their kid is going to a specialty school where all they do is learn blank. I was like, right. oh, that's that wasn't my experience. <laughs> right, right. Did you come right from Hawaii to Los Angeles and mm-hmm. to, to jump in? And was that like a decision like, this is where I go to get yeah. into TV and movies? A 100%. Yeah. <laughs> I, I graduated high school. I worked that summer and I moved a month after my 18th birthday. I just moved here. So October 1st, 1997. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And did you, because you've done a lot of work with the Groundlings, was that like kind of a first stop was the Groundlings? Yes. When yeah. I moved here, and I feel that anybody who moves here is like, I'm going to be an actor. Ugh, that it's, you have no idea how to do it. Yeah. And that depression sunk in pretty quickly of, I don't, I'm here, but it's a gigantic place. And, you know, you see back when, I guess they still have flyers with little rip tabs, <laughs> but you get a Backstage West thing, you would see one of those flyers, and the only thing you really have an opportunity to do is audition for weird plays. I remember I didn't have a car, and I bust down, I bust from Santa Monica to the Pacific Palisades to audition for a play. Yikes. And when I got there, the guy was like, oh, this is kind of a, all the parts are for older people, like much older people. And he took pity on me. He's like, you can watch it if you want to. <laughs> and then I just thought, what am I doing? I don't know anything. And then this woman I worked with took pity on me. And she was dating a working actor. And she took me to see a screening of the TV show he was on. And he talked to me afterwards and told me about the Groundlings. And when I, this is back in the day when you called and they mailed you a brochure. <laughs> when I looked at that brochure and I saw the people that had worked there and saw what they did... It was like this huge sigh of relief. And when I started taking classes there and moving through there and doing Second City and that kind of stuff, it was like, okay, okay, this feels like I'm doing the right thing and I have somewhere to go. Right. Well, I know your improv training has helped with puppet improv, but has studying improv made you a better performer in other areas too? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Well, it's interesting getting into Puppet Up and becoming an improviser who now puppeteers that reason we were all brought in and the puppeteers were trained to improvise was people were getting stuck on the script and I think learning improv helps with acting and helps with performing because it makes you capable of taking something different from someone and not being so locked into well this is how I imagined it and if you do it differently it throws me off the ability to expand the world. You know, there's always, in commercial editions, they always want you to add a button, uh, which is just this little noise or line you add on to the end of a poorly written commercial. But it is, it's something, the ability to, like, in a completely scripted thing where you can't do anything, that button is behavior. And that's a major thing, just learning behavior, filling it up with your your point of view. And there was one other thing I was going to say about that in terms of, improv helping you with being a performer i've lost it i'll come back to it (laughs) okay (laughs) so let's talk about how did that first connection with uh, the jim henson company and the groundlings how did that happen patrick bristow who directs puppet up is a groundlings alum and i'd known him for a few years he'd 
I don't know if he'd ever... Yes, he had directed me in a show of of somebody else's. And I'd always heard about Patrick, how incredible a director he was. He was sort of legendary for taking people's sketches that other directors wouldn't understand or reject and nurturing them and making them work. And he was the best with some of the weirdest sketches that people put up. And I remember someone saying, Patrick's so great because if you put something up that he doesn't get, he says, what was your idea? And he helps you make that idea come true. So when I got an email from him saying, do you want to try this puppet up thing? Or do you want to try taking an improv puppet class? It's like, yes, please. Okay. And I think in Patrick's mind, I was a funny improviser. He directed a couple of gas shows I was in, which is a short form improv show at the Groundlings. And I think he remembered I was tall. <laughs> you know, I'm sure when they said the criteria, height was a big one. And he probably thought of all of his tall friends first. Yeah. What was the trickiest part in, in those early days of learning the Henson style of puppet? Because had you done puppets before? Had no, you, never. Nothing? Yeah. So what was the, the trickiest part of kind of getting thrown in there at the Jim Henson Company? The listening and eye contact. Oh, that was my point about uh, what improv teaches you is when you're an improviser, you're supposed to be focused on your scene partner. You're supposed to be listening to them as opposed to hatching stuff in your brain. You still have that. You still have an awareness of the scene and the audience and your opinion, but you're really supposed to focus like 80% of yourself onto the other person. And it makes you a much better actor because you're listening to what they're saying and responding as opposed to just kind of going through how you thought the line should go. And with improv, people constantly talk about eye contact and looking at the other person. And when you're first learning to puppeteer, you're all you're doing is focusing on yourself. What's my puppet doing? Where is it looking? You're, there's all that uh, unconscious stuff you do with your body. You're now 100% conscious of with a puppet. And until that becomes second nature, your listening goes out the window. So listening and really responding to what someone else said while being a good puppeteer was the major hurdle. And... For me, the way to get over that was I would make sure my puppet was down when I heard the suggestion. So I wasn't looking, I wasn't framing up and trying to figure out how my puppet looked. And then I would stand to the left because I'm right-handed. So my head was off camera (laughs) and I would stand in one place, which is not good for human flesh improvisers. But I knew that I knew enough about improv and dialogue and that kind of stuff that I could survive without getting yelled at too much. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was my major hurdle. Did you pick up on the using a monitor pretty quickly? Kind of. I picked up on lip sync and staying up straight quicker. That was that was how I yeah survived. Was stand in one place. Right. If you if you get lost, move it towards your head. <laughs> you know that thing of like get it in your body where you understand what up up is. Yeah. And lip sync made a lot of sense to me. That was the thing that that came relatively easy, and I think kind of right away. But, yeah, the left-right stuff was initially very, you know, manic and uh, crazy. And then that thing that, you know, everybody tells you, which is correct slowly. And (laughs) when you correct slowly, you figure it out. And I don't like working hard at stuff. I like things to come to me easily, and then I do them. If I love something, I will, because I worked very hard at improv, but the way I worked hard at improv didn't feel like I was working hard, and with puppets, it felt like I had, you have to work hard, you have to physically try this, and I didn't rehearse at home as as much as everyone else, so maybe, yeah, it came sort of easy. (laughs) Walking away from camera is still hard for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's hard for, yeah. Yeah, it's hard for everyone, but. Were you with Puppet Up before they started doing shows, when it was just a class? I think so. They had done, they had done their main show, and they had gone to Aspen. Okay. And maybe they had gone to Australia for the first time. I think, but that might have been when I was taking classes. Right. They had definitely done the Aspen, and I think they had done the TBS show, and then I started, and. Um, but yeah, I don't even know how long I've been doing this. I think 12 years, maybe 13. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I know Brian always says, like, it was never meant to be a show. Like, it wasn't supposed to, it was just supposed to be classes, and then someone was like, oh, do a show on the lot, and then the guy from Aspen was there, or a person from Aspen, I don't know if it was a guy, but uh, now come do it at Aspen, and then it just kind of snowballed into this thing, so, um, but I wasn't 100% sure if you were there from, like, those first shows, or... No, I, because I was so obsessed with it when I first started, now I, ugh, I would have gone to those shows if that was an opportunity. I, yeah, I, I don't know how long I did it before I started performing. I was there, I was part of that first crop of non-puppeteers who was brought in. So that's, if that yeah. means anything in the timeline. Yeah, well, you've done, I mean, just so many shows at yeah. this point, like <laughs> thousands of shows um, with Puppet Up um, and just everywhere. I would love to know, what is your definition of like a perfect improv scene? Like, lights blackout whatever you're going to sit down and you can just go yeah that was a good scene um we really pay off a suggestion it's not something we've done a million times that we sort of shoehorned into the suggestion which working with the same people over and over again can even in you know in all forms of improv can happen pretty easily especially if you have the same kind of characters you can get into rhythms with each other so when it's completely weird and came completely out of the suggestion, I l and it's, it's a hard thing when you're improvising for people who've paid a lot of money. If you're in a, a show at a 99-seat theater and the scene could end in two seconds and someone could clap in and change it and it's very, uh, is it ephemeral, the word I want? It's... It's a lot easier to just make weird choices because it doesn't matter, and if it tanks, who cares? There's another thing happening right after that. But with Puppet Up, there's a little bit of an obligation to give them what they paid for. I'll just speak for myself. Sometimes I make tried and true choices with characters. I know this is a strong character, I know this character very well, and the audience is not going to be confused by this character. But the times where sometimes I've been in the show and I can feel it, I can feel it's not working for me, and I can feel my controlling this or my fear taking over and I'll force myself to be like just pick something weird pick a weird puppet you don't normally pick pick a voice that is just mirrors the voice of someone else and or just something random just do that and I think those are the perfect improvs where you're just really listening you're just taking stuff off of each other it gets really silly and weird and you're not doing something you've done before. Uh, improv we did, which I know you like to reference a lot, <laughs> where I played a squirrel, and I don't think I talked the entire time. No, you didn't talk. The, it was just you and I in the, in the scene, and you didn't talk the entire time. That, to me, especially as someone who loves to talk, <laughs> was one of the ones I love the most. And another one is when you make a weird choice that you you hope your scene partner will get, and they do, so I think it was another one. It was you, me, and maybe Brian Clark. And you two were at McDonald's, and you were working at McDonald's in the front, right, very close to camera. And you'd been talking for a while, and I'd entered very far back in between you two. And I just didn't talk, and I didn't talk. And finally I was like, excuse me, I'd like to order, please. <laughs> and you two turned around like, oh, sorry, ma'am. And then I just went... Um, you know, it was just that play of this woman threw a fit and then was still not ready to order. And right. it just, it was very stupid. It was very simple. And we all just understood what the other one was doing in the moment and nothing was pre-planned. So those are two that stand out to me. Yeah. And I think, um, what's fun about doing puppet improv the way that we do it with a monitor is if you were doing regular improv where it's just your bodies you're not using puppets you might not recognize that the person came in behind you and that's what's fun with puppets um i'm kind of going off on a tangent here but that's fun with what we do because you know that other person's there and you can almost purposefully ignore them you know and you can do that in fleshy improv too i guess but yeah and you i have done it in fleshy improv it's definitely a faith thing you have to you have to know kind of based on what we've set up like if you were talking about a serial killer and how scared you are of serial killers and you hear people laughing and you know it's not you you're like i'm pretty sure someone's behind me right. uh pretending to be a serial killer so i'm going to just keep talking and hope that that's what's going on uh but yes in puppet improv it's very fun to do that to upstage each other and not have to worry about it yeah and 
We did that with the um, Zoom school where I was in the middle right. and you and, uh, who was it? Oh, Raymond were yeah. the students. Yeah. And we got to play that idea of we're in a Zoom box and you guys can be slightly behind me, but, but my puppet never turns to look at you because we're all staring at a computer screen in theory. Right. Yeah, you can, puppetry has a really fun thing of fun stage pictures. And that's another thing I'm always proud of because I am a very stationary puppeteer and puppet up. <laughs> Is something that really uses the puppetry and is really fun, and it's not just about the funny things you say. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've done, as we said, uh, just hundreds of shows, and you've done a lot of runs. Um, you know, like we went to Australia together, and we did a ton of shows, and Knott's Berry Farm, where you're, and and uh, Toronto, and everything, where you're doing a bunch of shows night after night. What are your kind of tricks to keep that fresh? Because, as you said, it is kind of like well, we're going to do this scene again, so we could just do the same <laughs> joke that landed last night. But how do you keep it How do you keep it fresh for yourself? I try to mix up the characters I use. I try to mix up the puppets I use. I have puppets I prefer, and I prefer them because I think they make it easier to mix it up. Uh, if you keep picking up humanoid puppets, you're a little bit stuck in their, their gender and their age versus squirrels and rodents. It's pretty easy to make them anything. So I try to make... That's why I picked those puppets up. Also, they're lightweight, and I love them. <laughs> but I force myself to pick different accents. And it's the same thing with any improv I do, is I really, really, really try to nail the suggestion and listen to my scene partner. Because no matter what, and it's what's interesting about teaching improv is people get up there and they think they need to come up with everything, and they need to come up with everything right away. And if you're doing that, you're limited to your imagination and how much you can shove down the audience's throat in the 30 seconds you had between the suggestion and when the scene started versus, you know, what are they doing? They're building a teepee. And you just say one little line with one little accent and let the other person talk. And then you just go, oh, what they just said. And you both surprise yourselves and each other by what you make up. It's very stone soupy. Yeah. Is that the, does anyone get that reference? <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is, the other great thing about performing with you and Puppet Up is, you know, it is improv and you are supposed to, you know, it is made up on the spot and, and we get suggestions from the audience. Thing. And I think you've done this very well. And I don't think I've necessarily done it, but you've, you've done, you, you have characters mm -hmm. and you have like these, these two characters that, not in every show, but in a lot of shows. And one is like the weasel mm -hmm. um, who <laughs> is the host of the show. I don't even know if that weasel has a name. Maybe you have a name for it, but it's never said. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and she just tears apart the X. Um, for those of you who haven't seen is there's a part in the show where we do like a variety show and the weasel is the host of the variety show. And she just kind of says it like it is, like that was a really horrible <laughs> act. So, uh, and then the other one is, uh, and I'm totally blanking on the name, and I should have, I, I thought about this yesterday, and I was going to write it down, but is the fish. Gene Stripe. Gene Stripe, Gene Stripe, <laughs> yes, of course. Um, who's just manic and crazy, and um, so yeah, I don't know, I just would love to talk about characters in improv too, because I think people, when they think improv, you're just like, no, you must be completely a blank slate and just go wherever the scene takes you, but then you've had all this great success with these characters in the show. Well, because Groundlings is very character heavy, and Groundlings is an improv school in Los Angeles, and their mission statement kind of is improvising from a character point of view. And you build up character. So a lot of this, the voices and stuff I have, I've been improvising with and building, and I've written sketches for, or some are just entirely in the improv world. Uh, but the idea of having a character is you just have this really strong point of view. So you know, like with the weasel, I've played, I've done that voice for years in different characters. And, you know, her human form, I get, her name is Eartha Moon. She has a whole, you know, world to her. But the major thing about her is she's very fantastical sounding, but very blunt and pretty honest. You know, <laughs> there's that. And when she emerges in Pup It Up, it's mostly my ability to chastise the audience for what they have been doing to us for however long we've been up there <laughs> until, up until that point. Which, you know, if you've seen the show, or if you haven't seen the show, people like to yell out a lot of horrible stuff. Right. And it's fun to give them grief for how much they've yelled out. It's also fun to just interact with them. It's kind of the only time I get to interact with them. So... 
because that's definitely something that can get very rote. And uh, so for me, I always tell myself, we'll mix it up. You were super negative last time. Start this one really positive. Sometimes I have nothing and I'll think like, oh, what day is it? It's Sunday. Let's give them grief because it's the Lord's Day and they just yelled uh, something awful at us. Right. Um, or I'll just say, hello, and they'll say hello back. And it'll be like, oh, so I can control you? Like You'll just let me yell at you and you yell back. Sometimes it's just I'll, I'll have that weasel look and someone will giggle weird. It'll be like, that woman, you know, or <laughs> that guy or something. So, yeah. um, But what helps is coming from this character point of view of anything you do, I'm hyper listening to you and I'm hyper paying attention to you and I'm going to tell you the absolute truth in this very fantastical way. And it's the same thing. And then I'm going to watch what my fellow puppeteers do and pick it apart from an improv teacher point of view or from a feminist point of view or from a puppeteer point of view or just the idea of it's such a hard setup for the puppeteers. It's like, what are these pu puppets doing? They're juggling, you know, n flaming knives. And space work on space work is uh, making space for objects in your hands. So if you watch live improv, it's, you know, someone forms their hand. So it looks like they're holding a gun on camera. And this is why no improv shows ever work on camera. It looks weird. It only, the suspension of disbelief only works in real life. Yeah. And so bunnies pretending to juggle things, it's like we can see the bunnies on camera and these are these imaginary flames we're supposed to see. It really sets up the puppeteers <laughs> for failure. Yeah. So then it's just fun as the weasel to just be like, we know it's terrible. I just yell at people. And then Gene Stripe is the probably the flip side of me which is all that like sad panic covered up with intense joy like this woman has not ac accessed any of her feelings but what i love about her is she's so supportive so she's a fun character to play in things where she doesn't get to talk a ton because she's just that person who will go oh well that's wonderful good for you like it's yeah. it's a very joyous character to play and so it's really fun to play her in scenes yeah, that well, the question? it does, and and I think it's a good point of like, and I I I guess I I, I maybe I have done this and pop it up, but in other places is uh, when you have a character and like you know um, uh, what the weasel you know that you know the weasel's attitude, you know Gene Stripe's attitude, what she's gonna think. It almost makes the improv easier because it's like, oh well, now Gene Stripe is in a supermarket, and now Gene Stripe is in a library, and now Gene Stripe, and so. You just know what this character's point of view is going to be. Yeah, and it doesn't matter what her age is or what her puppet is or what anything about her. You just boil this person down to point of view, attitude. Yeah. And because if you're in you in an improv, you're sort of stuck with your normalness. The fact that you exist in the world and you don't cause scenes. You know, you don't yell at people. You don't pick fights. You don't say everything you feel and think. And so, for the most part, most of our lives are pretty normal, you know? But when you play a character, they are the person who is going to pick the fight. They are the person who, when you ask them, do you like this, they will say no and tell you a detailed reason why. And obviously, for me, most of my characters are some part of me, good or bad, that I've exaggerated. But, you know, the number one rule of improv is yes and. And it's the hardest thing for people to get past because... For the most part, you wouldn't yes and in life, right. you know? If someone said, uh, you know, if someone pulls a gun on you, you might put your hands up and, and then, and, I don't know, you would, but you wouldn't add on to that. You wouldn't, <laughs> right. versus if you're playing a character, like Gene Strutt, <laughs> someone holds a gun up and it's like, oh, a gun. It's very not, like, and the other idea is, like, you're, you, you want a positive response to that. So the positive response is, like, well, Gene Stripe's very nurturing and would like to know more about this person and their journey and would like to support them and, and be supportive of other people. You know, like, that's where the character point of view makes it way more fun than if it was just us. We'd just be scared and behave. Right, right. Yeah. Not cause a scene. Yeah. <laughs> Not cause, cause a problem. A scene and all yeah. we want to watch is four-minute scenes. <laughs> right. Puppet Up led to you doing a lot of puppet television work mm -hmm. uh, and movie work as well. And um, uh, sort of the first thing listed on uh, your IMDb is War and the Ape. Did you do puppets in War and the Ape? I did. Puppet? I was just in one episode. It was Bad Pofo or something like that. I played a thug. And my 
memory of that, my big memory of that is we were wheeling down the street holding puppets and we couldn't, the, we were, there were three of us next to each other on these dollies and you kind of, it was an uneven sidewalk and I just remember you had to sort of push yourself with your hand and your foot on a sidewalk and I remember my hand got rolled over and it was walking away from camera so blowing my brain but I was between two people so I was like I'll just keep it up just keep it straight Colleen just keep it straight it was a fun show I totally forgot about that I wouldn't have thought that would be my first credit <laughs> wow first thing I do and I'm on a cart on the ground on the street <laughs> wheeling away from camera yeah well that's how you learn that's how you get into it yeah well and then shortly after that you also became a panelist on Late Night Liars <laughs> uh, as Kashmir Ramada and was that because there was, yeah, there, that was like a series, right? That mm -hmm. was like a kind of a, a series that you were a regular on. Yeah. Like every episode. Yeah. It was really from zero to something real quick. <laughs> right. uh, there had been workshops and I had done sort of a Valley Girl character and they cut her and then last minute brought her back. And I remember going in and pretty quickly realizing that my puppetry was not up to the standards of doing a job like that. So it was a big, it was a very steep learning curve. Most of the initial stuff was just holding her up straight and talking for a long period of time. So my lip sync had to get better and she's a very long skinny puppet. And which is great that I'm this tall and I have, my arms are this long, but it means you're in a very uncomfortable position for a very long time trying to keep the puppet from getting crooked like your arm. And yeah, myself and Brian Clark were so brand new, and we were two of the panelists. And then on either side of us, it's Tyler Bunch and Donna Campbell, who are, you know, perfect puppeteers. Right. And Tyler can keep his arm up forever. <laughs> and this was a game show, so you had to stay up, because there's, you know, rules about game shows. There's, like, laws about game shows. You can't ruin it. And that... I got pretty good at, you know, figuring out how to lean. Oh, I got very good at leaning puppets against desks yeah. in my career. But then... We did all these interstitials and promos that were, once again, like sets and moving around and that thing of just trying to put a cell phone to the ear. Just being like, I have to, there's a cell phone in this hand and got to get to the ear and turning and listening. And it was like, so yes, it was definitely a crash course in uh, puppetry. Yeah. Well, that's good. You're making money doing it. I, guess. I know. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. was on Game Show Network. And I think four people saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Another show I, I definitely want to talk about because I know it's a show that, um, at least from from hanging out with you, you you loved being on. Yeah. Uh, was No You Shut Up. Yes. And uh, you were star uh, Slesh Schlesinger. Am I saying Schlesinger, yeah. Schlesinger. Did you like working in that sort of, because that show was sort of like current events and politics and that kind of thing, sort of a daily show type thing. Did you enjoy working in that style as opposed to something maybe more scripted or something? I, I did. I loved it. I mean, it's, it's the perfect lineup of what I was like trained to do. You know, improvise and puppeteer behind a desk that you can lean on with a small <laughs> squirrel puppet. Yes, I loved it. Paul of Tompkins is one of the most lovely people on the planet. And getting to just improvise with him and with Michael Ostrom and Drew Massey and uh, Ted Michaels, it was so fun to just say silly things to each other and make each other laugh and, and yell at each other. And mostly, I just tried to make Paul laugh constantly. And the political part of it was always a little interesting because we were all kind of playing terrible people, but I was one of the worst people. You know, I was this racist squirrel. I'm set up as a racist squirrel. And trying to find how do you make that funny and smart and not just end up just being a racist? Whereas, you know, which... I think that comedy, too, has changed and will change more. There's stuff I've watched of her that maybe was funny then, but now I'm like, yeah, I could have been smarter about that. Or that was just... I don't know that that was the greatest choice or I wish that the, that didn't exist anymore. Uh, but I did. I loved it. I loved doing it. And we got more scripted in the last couple seasons, which was a little bit of a... I know I pushed back on it a tiny bit because I they'd hired these great writers, but when you've been playing a character and then someone starts writing for them, there's that little bit of a like, well, no, ah, that's not how she sounds. This, you know, you have this idea of like, I've been writing for her, yeah. but the writers were so great and lovely and would be like, yeah, you can change it or yeah, do yours and do mine or whatever. And whatever would make it was great, but it was just really, it was really fun and I loved it. And if the, but it was also in 
Univision, which is a thousand miles away from where anyone lives. <laughs> and we were in a basement and you know, it was very low budget, but yeah. it was delightful. Well, you bring up, you know, suddenly they're writing for you and you're writing and, and you're saying like, oh, I wouldn't necessarily say it that way. Could you talk a little bit about the process of, and this not just for that show, it could be any show, of suggesting a new or alternate line when you're working on something? You know what I mean? Especially with an improv background and you're like, well, this could be a little bit funnier here. But <laughs> how do you kind of approach that of like, I'm going to, can we do a take where I take it this way? I don't know. You you talk about it, what you do. Uh I've never been the, the most diplomatic about that. I really know my place when I'm on set and it's a, a TV show or something where I'm a, playing a human being. I say whatever they want me to say. You know, if, if there's room to improvise at the end of the scene, I will. Or if they say, but I just do what I'm told and I that's it. Puppetry, almost every job I've done has been approached from some character I already do or some character that already exists and or I workshopped or something like that and then there's some improv element to it so you know, shut up was improvised late night liars the whole game part of it there's there's quips and there's whatever's but there's we had a workshop where I brought in a character I play and then the game show part of it there's a lot of improv in there and other jobs like that so I've had I definitely think I'm not the person to go to for being the most tactful or diplomatic about that, if you want advice on that. <laughs> Mostly it's been finding whoever the person is who you know can say yes or no and saying, I don't want to say this. Can I change this? Or sometimes I'm nicer like, so this line, I don't know, would she say that? You know, you try to sort of figure it out. But I've never been somebody who likes to beat around the bush. Right. I feel like it's kind of condescending. If the ultimate thing is, I don't want to say this line. And I get emotional about stuff, too. So if I was giving advice, I would say people get very exhausted by actors saying, I don't want to say this line or whatever. So pay attention to the dynamic and decide how much of it you have control over and have a good reason why you want to change something. And be respectful of the work writers did. But if you're asking me what I did, it's, it's I'm pretty much like, I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm always just so like, yes, okay, thank you for letting me be here. Let me, let me, I'll say whatever, what do you need me to say? I'll say it this way, okay. But that's what, I actually, I had this question for later, but I might as well bring it up now because it, it, it dovetails with this, is one thing I really admire about you and in the times that we've worked together is that if something isn't working or something is not right, you speak up about it. And like I just said, like I am very like, I, I don't want to make any waves. I don't want anybody. But you and I worked on a, a project recently where they wanted us to, we, to roll in through a doorway with puppets, but they had <laughs> carpet down and it was like impossible to do. But like in my head, I'm just like, okay, well, I'm going to try this. I'm going to do it. But you're like, you, you actually stop and you say, no, look, we're not going to be able to do this. You need to bring in some some wood here for us to roll on or, or get rid of the carpet or whatever. And I, I just think that you have this great ability to like just speak up and just to say, and, and it makes everything better and it makes everything easier. And, um, and, and I don't know if necessarily there's even a question in there <laughs> other than if you see something, you're not trying to don't cause a scene like we were talking about earlier, you know, yeah. just keep going with this. And, but you will say, no, stop, this isn't going to work. We're, you know, or like the puppets, the eyes are funky or whatever we're, you know. And um, I think that also makes it, especially on that show, people were coming to you as like, can we do this with puppet? Like asking you <laughs> as the puppet, you know, and I don't know if that's a role necessarily you want to be as the puppet expert, but I don't know. You just have this really great ability to, to speak up and say, like, this isn't going to work. We need to change this. Well, thank you. What I would say about that is, for a long time, the only thing I would speak up about was what my character would say or the comedy because I felt confident in that and that because that was my training. This most recent job, that was very much I'd just come off of a job where we I was there for five months. I played the main character and... I, it's the most like immersive puppet experience I've had where I was in it. I watched how everything was made because I was almost always on set and playing multiple characters and stuff like that. So 
it was interesting because normally, which I tried to do on that job, was like, I don't know. I mean, I'm not in charge. Right. But then it becomes, they just kept bringing whoever they could get because they hadn't worked with puppets before. They were just like, well, you're a puppeteer. You could tell us how to do it. And trying to fight that, they're like, no, I don't, no. <laughs> and then they're like, all right. And this time, yeah, I was like, I, I know this. Like, I know you can't do this. I Just from doing this now for so long, and so concentrated just recently that, yeah, I learned that. And when I first started puppeteering, Victor Yard was our puppet captain on Late Night Liars. And I would watch him demand things. And I thought, oh, wow, he's being rude. Maybe he was. I don't know. It's been so long. But now I realize as somebody who's been doing this for a long time that you have to ask for what you want because they will not give it to you on their own. Right. Unless unless it's like a Henson gig. Like, obviously, when and we'll probably talk about it, but Happy Time Murders, you didn't have to ask for anything. Right. You had like 17 monitors around you and monitor glasses if you wanted it. You did, everything was there and ready to go. Yeah. Well, that's actually, my next question was about Happy Time Murders. And I believe that was your pu- first puppet feature film. Yes. Right, that you did. My one and only. Yeah. <laughs> so far, <laughs> so far. For you, how much prep work went into your character and, and the things you were doing for Happy Time Murders before you even got in front of the camera? Very little. Originally, the character I played, which was completely edited out of the movie, was supposed to be Southern, and they changed her a little bit before we started filming and made her from Essex. And so I was like, oh, okay. So I called Louise Gold, and I said, can I... Or I didn't call her, I emailed her, and I said, can I send you this... And can you just record it with an Essex accent? And I think Louise was like, well, I'm not... <laughs> or Sussex. Where were they from? Essex or Sussex? You know, that, uh, like, really, like, that kind of accent. Anyway, I, Louise recorded it for me. And I learned it just from Louise's version. And then went and did it, um, auditioned with it again, just to prove that I could do it. And we had one meeting with a specialist who was just kind of like, oh, yeah, speed it up or slow it down kind of thing. Literally, that was the thing they always say, literally, like. And then we did the scene, and it was interesting because I I don't have that accent down, so there was a tiny bit of improv in that scene. <laughs> and you could, I will tell you, I could feel in the scene, this isn't making the movie. It's not oh, going to really? make the cut. And I was, actually, there was something, because there was a lot of downtime. And this is the only reason I'm sad they're not in the movie is I put the puppet on and I was like, it's always been a problem for me because I'm not a you know genius puppeteer, is how do I do what I would do in this puppet? And I was talking to Drew Massey and I said, I mean, I would, if you imagine holding your hands up so that they're kind of resting by your boobs or your chest and they're flopped over and then they just sort of flop on the on the wrist and your arms stay there like you're holding a purse in your elbow but they're just flopping around and i showed drew that and was like is there a way we could make the puppet do that he's like yeah and we went in and uh him amanda maddock and i figured it out and amanda put these poles through the elbows and they, I think they weighted the hands and really loosened up the wrists. And so whenever I would do her, Drew would be behind me, making her hands flop <laughs> around. And he would, I mean, Drew's an incredible assist with hands. I mean, he's an incredible puppeteer, but right. with hands, if you ever have an opportunity. And he would make the, these floppy hands, like, lean forward and hit Melissa <laughs> McCarthy. And it would just be so gross and annoying. And it, oh, I loved it. It killed me. Yeah. And made her a very hard puppeteer to puppet without an assist because she had these rods coming out of her elbows. And then the rest of it was just sort of, you know, these sort of peripheral stupid characters that just got thrown into, which was really fun, but I didn't do a lot of, you know, emotional work right. beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> right. And another show I know that you, uh, I assume you enjoyed working on, maybe that was the wrong <laughs> assumption. Um, no, but I think you did, is the Curious Creations of Christine McConnell. I did. I and did you did. really had a fun time on that show, um, just from, I, I know you're talking about it, but you played Rose, the, the raccoon. Yes. I hadn't puppeteered in a while. It's, that's every job I'll start with is, I hadn't puppeteered in a while. <laughs> and I put Rose on, and she's so heavy and 
all her weight is in my thumb. It's in her jaw. It just hangs off of it. Hence, if you a fan of the show, why Rose's mouth is always crooked. It's <laughs> hanging off of my thumb. And I remember that first shot. We were uh, strapping a guy to a table and we were going to take his nipples or whatever. Or it was right before we were doing that. And I thought, I can't, I can't do this. I don't know how I'm going to do this. You know, and then by the end of the day, you've... Your muscles have remembered how to hold a giant puppet up forever. Yeah. I did. I love doing Rose. She's, I think, the most manic character I've ever played. And Kirk Thatcher was our director. And, you know, Kirk is just like, yeah, do whatever, man. And we were really unsupervised. You know, no one was really around to yell at us or tell us what to do. So the show just got sillier and weirder. And it was Michael Ostrom and Drew Massey, who I love working with, and... And Christine was just so lovely and exhausted because she was baking and doing this and, you know, wearing corsets to fit into those, or not to fit into, but create the shape she wanted. So she was just always like out of breath, hasn't (laughs) eaten. And not to shame corsets. I watched a whole thing about how corsets worn correctly or whatever, but she was wearing them very uh, tight and, and she was sleep deprived and she... She just became a really good friend. She's uh, fantastic. So, yeah, I was. I realized what we were doing was really cool and different, and I was proud of it. I had no idea who would watch it, which is my favorite kind of thing to make for you. Like, I don't know who would watch this, but I would. Yeah. Well, I remember one day I was I was there because that was filmed on the, the Henson lot, and you took me on a little tour of, like, the little thing. And I just remember, like, it being so – like, you had so much set – built on that stage like you had to squeeze between sets to get to other sets and as someone who is a tall puppeteer yeah um how do you (laughs) is there anything you do to make sure that you don't get injured when you're being squeezed into tiny spaces to puppeteer on any show no i mean the the, what was great about that was tim legassi was our puppet captain and he would kind of figure everything out for me before I even had to get there because it was, you know, built on the ground. So I was on a wheelie cart again. Yeah. It was just sort of shoving yourself around, but Tim was an incredible puppet captain to just sort of be an advocate for me and figure out the way that I could do it and use his experience ahead of mine to just be like, I've already kind of problem solved this for you. She has a fork hand. So Amanda, who was our wrangler on the job, gave me a giant foam thing because I got whacked in the face with that (laughs) hand constantly. It was a real fork. Yeah, I remember, so Morgana Ignis, who played the Edgar in the suit, and I were the two who were on set, you know, lugging around heavy things and ruining our bodies. And Michael and Drew were just sitting in chairs with little remote controls doing the mouth flaps and stuff. And Tim was, you know, shoved under, you know, everything, working the cat's tail and stuff. But... Yeah, no, I think you just get injured. When we first started puppeteering or learning how to puppeteer, there was a lot of preciousness about wrangling your rods and being very careful and delicate. And I remember being like, okay, I guess. (laughs) And then it's just like, no, you just, you whack straight into things, you hurt yourself constantly, and it's just sort of the nature of the beast, I guess. Yeah, and hopefully not too bad that you can't puppeteer the next day. Yeah, you know, or you yeah. you just do. Your shoulders are all destroyed. Yeah, I remember, like, our opening night of, the night before our opening night in Australia, like, my back, I tweaked my back, and I was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but you got to do it. Yeah, <laughs> it's not good for your body. Puppeteering no. is not good. We're like pro wrestlers, where yeah. it's, like, horribly bad. <laughs> I mean, they're a little bit more physical than we are, but maybe not. I don't know. Maybe not. The other one I want to talk about uh, more recent is Earth to Ned. You played Betty, and you played a digital puppet. Yeah. First of all, was that the first... I know maybe you had um, done a few digital puppet stuff and puppet... You hadn't? That was your first one? No, I think we had a a very tertiary lesson, and that lesson set me up for failure. So finish your question, and then I'll tell you. Well, no, just (laughs) making that jump from doing all these, uh, you know woodland creatures these and and rose and all that to all of a sudden now you're doing a digital puppetry on uh, on the digital puppetry system yeah we learned that really quickly they were like oh we'll learn the digital thing we, we're going to try to rotate more people into that hdps and i did it and i thought okay you know it's not a lot of bells and whistles on this because it's meant to be in a live show and flap the mouth great i know how to flap a mouth perfect this will actually be easier and when I got the job, Michael Ostrom, who had uh, been sitting, you know, flipping a remote control the whole time on Christy McConnell, ha- was going to have this heavy puppet on all the time. And I thought, ha, 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 look at me. I got something easy this time. 
And I sat down to it, and one of the first things someone said was, oh, no, it's not just flapping the mouth. It's you have to make mouth shapes like the words. And, you know, I blink that it's... <laughs> so if you want to make an E sound, you know, you can rig it however you want. Like, it gets easier that way. <laughs> if you want to make an E shape or, you know, anytime you make that shape with your mouth, you have to flap the mouth but also turn your wrist to the right. And if you want an ooh shape, you have to turn your wrist to the left. And if you want a F or a V, you need to flick this finger. Once again, we can put that on anything. <laughs> and it's like, What? And on this other joystick, blinking eyes, eyebrows, expression, tilting head. And she needs to appear and disappear. So here's a foot pedal. And we need her to get bigger and smaller. So here's like a gas pedal. And, you know, Colleen, I know you like still characters, but let's get her mobile. Madness. <laughs> it's like learning an instrument yeah. in, I think I had two weeks or three weeks. And I have mentioned, I, I don't like working hard on stuff. <laughs> it's not my, I don't even know how. The way that I would say, we know puppeteers who if you... But I feel like Donna Kimball is a person who, if you told her, you need to learn this, she would learn it, she would master it, and then tell you she's not that good at it, and not be being falsely modest. She would still have a standard for herself that's so much higher than anybody else. And she would just learn it, and know it, and know how to get better at it. And I was... Just kept looking at it, trying to approach it from different ways. Kept saying, growth mindset, Colleen, growth mindset, growth mindset. And then say, well, maybe you need to take a break from it so that your brain can comprehend it. You can only learn, what, five things a day or something like that. It, and I did get better at it. I did get better at it. But there was this, I think it was a full second delay, which sounds like nothing if you're not a puppeteer, but is a lot if you are a puppeteer. So... Even when I was getting better, I couldn't see if the mouth lined up with what I was saying. Right. So it was a very, it was what I thought I was going to go into and finally just be sitting and flapping my hand the whole time was one of the most stressful jobs I've ever had in my life. <laughs> it was intense. Would you, uh, if they said, uh, hey, Colleen, we have a new project, it's another digital puppet, would you go into it like, yeah, or go into like, oh, here we go again? I would go into it. With the knowledge that it's harder than I thought it was, that I would want to rehearse it a bunch, and that I would want an assist. I think the idea was she was supposed to be sort of, you know, one-stop shop, and for the most part she was, but I, I have no pride about assists. Like, I know some people want to do everything by themselves, or they're not even like they want to do everything by themselves because they think it's bad to have an assist they're very controlling in a not in a bad way or the in a bad way of what their puppet looks like and i have no problem with trusting someone and that's probably a, we circle back to improv of improv thing of i'm okay with somebody helping me and making something and i'll give i'll tell them oh i don't think they'd move that much or can we try this but i don't have this control thing about something like that where I would want to be in charge of how often she blinks and when she tilts her head or something like that. And then I think that would allow me to really focus on the performance of uh, her voice and, you know, her lip sync and stuff like that. But I w I mean, of course I would do it, but I would go in with eyes open this time. <laughs> right, right. Well, of course, we have to talk about Barbarian and the Troll. Uh, because, yes, I would uh, get in trouble if I did it. <laughs> uh, the Nickelodeon show that just relatively recently, as we're recording this, wrapped up its first season. And is there extra pressure on you as a performer when you're playing the lead character? Because you performed Brendar, who was the lead character in the show. I don't know that it's extra pressure. I didn't realize until it was a very lovely thing I, th I think alan said it at, um, when we wrapped about how i had set the tone and uh, set the tone of the show and kind of how it went and things like that and i didn't realize that was something i had had done but i realized when you're playing the lead character and she for the most part interacts with everybody in every scene there's a few scenes she's not in that it does affect everyone else's performance and the way you behave, if you're there all the time, and the way you talk to people, and the way you talk to... I mean, as puppeteers, all of us had worked together a bunch, so it wasn't like you walk into something, and this is the the biggest star, and their IMDb number is the highest. It wasn't that. <laughs> right. But it is the idea of, like, you're the person who's always there, and you're the person who 
always needs an assist or you're the person who is the center of the scene or has to, and you just end up setting, yeah, a tone for how it was. And I was so happy that not knowing that at the end, the, the response was positive. <laughs> Cause I was, I was doing what I would do normally, which is, this is what I think my character would do. This is how I, I think they would act. This is how I think they would respond to you. Do we want to change this, these lines a little bit? Oh, maybe we should change this. Or yes, of course, be like, don't say it like that. There's <laughs> footage of me doing that a couple of times and messing with other people's lines. That to me was the major thing. And just the responsibility of you just working way more than you ever have been. You, you're using your brain constantly. Yeah. Uh, going home and looking at my lines and highlighting and being like, oh, Brenda has a lot to say in this. <laughs> <laughs> and she was another, Kashmir Romana, she was another long puppet. So physically it's very exhausting. And, you know, and I, me and Alan were the two tall ones on set. So, you know, you're just constantly trying to stay out of frame and setting frame heights and stuff. Well, you also uh, played Queen Shimmerine mm -hmm. and you played several other characters. Do you have a method for keeping... Uh, your character straight like when you're working on a project like that even if it's a minor character that minor character may come back i don't you know you don't know but um do you write things down do you just keep it all in your head how do you how do you do it it's it's just keep it in my head it's basically like my improv background is you have a voice so with queen shimmerine i read her and i thought well she, you know she's the queen so she'll be sort of british e, -E. Uh, to anybody who's british like, <laughs> that's that's an inaccurate accent um <laughs> And then it was just reading her lines and coming up with the voice and just that, that sort of, Brenda, uh, you know, this, this horrible woman. And then the second I start talking like that, it's very easy to stay in her. It's like, oh, okay. And she's very still and the puppet, you know, so Botoxed. <laughs> and so, no, it's not hard. And, you know, like the beaver, the swamp beaver, I, I do a lot of Southern characters and I wanted to mix that one up. So I tried deep in my voice you know which i'd never done before and then once you're just in that voice it and this is coincidentally works really well for me like that beaver was exhausted and i was exhausted <laughs> and queen shimmerine's very still and i wanted to be very still because i was tired and 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 annoyed and you know i'm tired and annoyed at the end of the day and then the little carny gnome was as light as a feather and i was like yeah you know uh, sarah o is doing my hands and just rubbing those hands together and i, I think that was the happiest day on set i was so happy <laughs> so that's kind of yeah how i keep track of is is always going back to that voice locks you into an attitude which then or the attitude locks you into a voice by you know who knows which comes first and it makes it easier to be in that character and do you find that you have like Oh, this is the sentence I can say in that in that character to get me back in that character, or is it just more? Uh, I'll kind find that voice. Kind of, I guess. Yeah, for Shimmerine, it's it's sort of. No, I think with Shimmerine, it's the lisp. You know, it's the inhaling, which is exhausting, by the way. Inhaling <laughs> while talking, and with the beaver, it's just it's a it's a mouth shape and yeah. go deep. And carning them too, because he was another Southerner. I tried to try to make him more teethy. Yeah, so it's just making my face more that shape which sounds like mask work which is not what i'm doing <laughs> anyone who thinks it's mask work that's not what it is well and then you have to translate that all up your arm <laughs> yeah and who knows if it does sometimes i think i'm doing way more than i am and then i watch it and i'm like oh, i think that just sounds like me but you know any, someone who doesn't know me probably doesn't know what is um talking strictly puppetry and i because i just loved all the kind of behind the scenes shots that have popped up on instagram or whatever what is the most complex piece of puppetry that you did during barbarian and then troll oh that you're just like we did that that's we it took forever but we did that <laughs> oh there were so many what were the things well it was funny we were doing the rolling the boulder up the hill the, the it's in the credits she walks up the hill and then in i think it's the fourth episode or something she um they roll a boulder up a hill and we're all in green suits and nobody can see in these things you know there's like nettings pushed into your face and it's me and alan and drew and nikki depending on which one of those we were doing so it's just a bunch of us all crammed on this mossy tiny mountain and we're trying to figure it out and there's this idea of like, well, how do you push her under and how do you lift this thing up? And, and there's a, you know, the special effects guy are holding this giant fake 
boulder on a stick and they're trying to roll it up and they're in green and just shoving that thing up a hill was madness and it was really funny because we got snippy at each other it was like well okay yeah, uh, uh, uh. and because we were in green when mike mitchell our director walked over he was like hey guys you know like about to be like looks great you know he has no idea that he's like i walked over thinking it looks great you guys must be so happy and he just hears us like well okay like getting kind of short with each other i think that was probably the most technical there's a shot my, the the one of the more technical things that uh, was just really joyous was the demon Alvin at the end has wings and a tail and it was I played Alvin and Nikki was my Nicolette Santino was my assist and uh, Jenny Cassidy, the Canadian puppeteer, was doing the wings I believe and Peggy Etcher was doing the tail and the whole time we've been doing. Brenda, I had to, I was, Brenda's at the front, and I have to walk really slow in these walk and talk scenes, and I kept always walking too fast, and I would have to walk really slow, and, uh, and there was no one in front of me, so it was always up to me to make sure I kept myself slow, and they were like, you can run in this one, and that was four of us, and four all female puppeteers, all female, it sounds like we were half something else, uh, <laughs> all, the, the group was all women. Uh, running as fast as four women can run holding a puppet together and the you know camera B like, zooming along with us and that was at the very end and that's something that would have very much broken my brain week one and it was really fun to do it and to just tear along and with the camera going super fast and so that was one of my favorite technical things we did yeah well if people haven't seen Barbarian the Troll I suggest they go check it out because it's just a it's a great puppet series, and it's puppets, 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 like the whole, you know, like it's just, it's fantastic. There are no people. <laughs> no, it's great. Well, as we're wrapping up here, I know that you have uh, created your own shows at times. Uh, is there any sort of desire to create a puppet show or to pitch well, your own stuff? Well, I kind of, I did actually glop, which is the glorious latest puppetry. I don't know if you were going to get to yeah, that. It was on my list, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, we, we created it in the pandemic. It was Donna Kimball, uh, Alice Deneen, and myself. It, Donna's original idea of, you know, Glorious Ladies of Puppetry. And she asked me if I wanted to write it. And I just thought of all these ideas of something. And when I pitched to them, they were like, well, why don't you just do all of them? So that's what we ended up doing. So it's sort of a sketch show. And I would very much love to do that, to make that a, a full-fledged show. Because what I love about it is... I get to write on it, which is my favorite part of most of the stuff. And I love that it gets to change and move around and be really silly and weird. And then that the focus of it is not just women, but just inclusivity and a bunch of different people working on it. And because we filmed the whole thing in quarantine, everybody was either in their own homes or they came over to a guest room in Donna's house, but they were isolated so no one could help each other unless they lived with someone who could assist them. So what I'd love to do and what makes me the most excited about it in the future, if we continue to work on it, is the idea that people who are newer to puppets could be assists or we could help them. We could let them, you know, if they have incredible voices and they can do pretty good lip sync, have them do that and we can stand next to them and make them stand up straight or do incredible things with their arms. So that to me is... It's not so much the story I would tell with puppets or the kind of puppets it would be. It's the idea of the kind of performers who could puppeteer. Because to me, that's always been my favorite thing. Is It's never been how great a puppeteer someone is. I totally respect it and love it. But it's always been the performance that comes with it. And just bringing in different voices and different perspectives and different opinions to me makes it incredible. Because I do think there are some things out there that suffer from sameness. Yeah. And they would just be better if they brought more people in. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, yeah, everyone should check out Glorious Ladies of Puppetry. I'll have a link in the show notes for that. As we wrap up here, the final question I love to ask <laughs> is, what has been the highlight of your puppetry career so far? Oh, what has been the highlight? There's been a bunch. I was, I, you know what? I got a reminder because it was eight years ago around now that I was in... Um, Edinburgh, and oh, I feel bad now because I also New York was incredible. But okay, let's say Edinburgh was because I I really loved it. We were there for a month. I had just done that puppet game show in England, which is another 
I, Jesus Christ. I got to live in England for I don't know how long. And I got to meet Dave Chapman and Louise Gold and a million other people. Like, I, the names, you know, Andrew Spooner and Nigel Plaskett and, I, and Martin Baker. You know, it just, oh, that was incredible. Sorry, this answer is getting really long. No, but it's I, perfect. Uh, I was, you know, madly in love with uh, Dave and Louise, like, instantly. Just total crush. Uh, but we were in Edinburgh and it was, I was there for a month. I was there with friends. We were... Where we lived, if we came home from the show in time, you could see the fireworks every night from the military tattoo that happened. We could go to shows all the time, and every night we'd come home, and Alan Trotman's wife, Diane, would cook food for us, and we'd just sit around the table and eat and drink and watch fireworks and talk about stuff. And Louise and Dave came over and visited, and so it was like, my new friends came, and you know. <laughs> and it was just, it was just really, really fun you know and I loved it and I think my some of my favorite experiences ever with puppets is that idea of you know I think when you want to be an actor you think about you know all the parts you're going to get to play and all the places you're going to get to see and all the people you're going to get to hang out with and you know I didn't end up being Meryl Streep well you know who knows there's time (laughs) but you know, you sort of resign yourself to like, okay, I guess. Hmm. And then all of a sudden you're in this weird puppet job you never thought you have. And you're you're in another country coming off of a another country. Well, I guess, no, because Edinburgh, is that, yeah, they're same country, different country, whatever. Yeah. But you're in this incredible place in this, you know, 200-year-old apartment laughing with your friends, watching fireworks. It's, you know, it's everything I wanted out of being an actor and I got it. Excellent. Well, Colleen, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks, Grant. It It was so much fun getting to sit and talk puppetry and improv with Colleen Smith. For links to Colleen's social media, as well as some of the things we talked about, check out the show notes for this episode, episode number 63, over at underthepuppet.com. And if you'd like to hear even more of my talk with Colleen, download the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android and click on the gift icon in the listing for this episode. Well, now it's time to announce the winner of episode 62's giveaway for a flat-footed frizzle puppet handmade by Under the Puppet guest David Stevens of All Hands Productions. The question was, what puppet was Joey Mazzarino using to interview people with before he got Murray Monster? And the answer was, a broccoli puppet. And many of you knew that his name was Bernie the Broccoli. And the winner is Joe Weatherford. Congratulations, Joe. Your orange flat-footed frizzle is on the way. This episode, we are giving away a brand new puppet deck, courtesy of PuppetDeck.com. Each puppet deck comes with 54 monster cards that you can instantly fold into a tiny puppet. Every card is pre-scored for easy folding so you can get your monster up and talking in seconds. And there's a space on the back of the card where you can create a mini character bio for your monster. To be entered to win, simply answer this question from the episode you just heard. Who helped Colleen Smith perfect her accent for her role in The Happy Time Murders? When you find the answer, send it in an email to underthepuppet at gmail.com with the subject line giveaway and you'll be entered to win. All entries for this giveaway must be received by September 15th, 2021. The winner will be chosen at random from all correct entries and be announced on the October 1st, 2021 episode of the show. One entry per household. Good luck. I want to take a moment to send a special thank you out to all the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who help make this show possible, and Patreon patrons at the producer level and above who get a special shout out are Vicki Sebring, David Akers, Tony Urbano, Kathy Crawford, Eve Cunning, and my great aunt, Dorothy Pachoco. To become a patron and support this show, visit patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. If you have questions, suggestions, or feedback about the show, call our voicemail line at 818-806-9604 or click the Call the Show button in the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. You can send me an email at underthepuppet at gmail.com or you can connect with the show on Instagram or Twitter by searching for Under the Puppet. And don't forget to tell a friend about the show. Thank you so much for listening. This episode of Under the Puppet was edited by Stephen Staver and features music by Dan Ring. Under the Puppet is a production of Saturday Morning Media and is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons. Become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and help spread the word by sharing your favorite Under the Puppet episode with a friend. 
Under the Puppet is copyright 2021 Saturday Morning Media Grant Pachoco Executive Producer. All rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com under the Puppet proudly presents the adventures of Timmy the Tooth Reunion. In this almost 90 minute video, you will hear great stories from the cast and crew who brought this amazing puppet show to life. Plus, you'll see never before seen artwork and exclusive behind the scenes video. Under the Puppet's Timmy the Tooth Reunion is available right now at timmy.underthepuppet.com. You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned, we'll be right back.